Church of God for this morning. I have a few announcements here that I want to get across. First of all, I'd like to say that the beautiful flowers here on the altar are in honor of Jen Burrow's birthday. So, birthday is here. You see how you may want to be here. Second, uh, we'd like to emphasize a little bit about the uh, Siski Water Walk. Um, the walk is not just for you, it's for adults as well. So if you're looking for volunteers to make work and yeah. different things. So if you're interested in one of the things, volunteer to help out. It's important. Hey, this is important. The Chris Kicks pancake is back. Yeah. Wow. I can assure you that this is real fun. Those of us who've seen it one or two times, definitely we can say it is fun. And those of you who have not, try catching a pancake with a styrofoam plate. Put it on the back. Hold it back. It's fun. So the church is asking that you please come. Bring your neighbor, bring your friends, bring your family. It's a real fun time. And it will be on March the 3rd in the fellowship hall after service. So we're asking that you please come to invite people out here to come out here. And by the way, the proceeds from these funds raising activity will go to Good Works Incorporated and have a September show. They do a fantastic job. We're still accepting our donation items for the sleeping bed ministry. If you have any donated items, please do so. We're still accepting our donation. We are announcing, I think that's all I have. Um, we'll go ahead. Have to do the white of the
little late, but you are here today. I can see the energy still from last night coming through. Uh, it was my first community choir in the report, and I was quite impressed. Matter of fact, I knew you all were singers, right? We proved that on Sunday morning, but I didn't know you were dancers. <laughs> And uh, there were many dancers uh, on stage that last night, but uh, since we're in time to prayer in just a moment, there was one dance that caught my eye in such a way that it made me praise the Lord, and that's because we have one of our own who we have been praying for that went through a hard time uh, hurting himself, and uh, he had been on a long recovery, and last night, in Jubilee, I heard some, come on! Baby, don't you want to go? We had a this going on. Uh, and we had a combo, we had all sorts of things going on last night. It was a great and wonderful time for our community. But it was an answer to prayer, so Brian, it was great. And I did praise the Lord when I saw you dancing last night. And all our members on stage, you and all, uh, just having such a joyous time. What a great celebration. Terry, thank you so much for putting that on. And it was such a good time, and uh, it's great to be here this morning, and uh, I know if you're like me, you were sick last week, still trying to recover, and I noticed this morning my voice was going out, so you may have a short sermon, depending on if that happens or not. But as we're here today, we do want to let you know, uh, we are a praying church, uh, and for many of our visitors that are here with us today, we want to point out a couple things. <coughs> the first is, in your bulletin, there's these little, little yellow cards. Uh, our whole church fills these out, both members and visitors. It does give you a chance to tell us a little about yourself, but on the back, uh, which, which you need to know is there's a uh, prayer request area, and everybody's free to write their own prayer request there. If you want to keep it confidential, just for the pastor, there's a box there you can check as well. In just a moment, our ushers will come forward. They're going to actually take these up, bring them to the altar at our prayer time, so just let you know that that's uh, an opportunity for you. We also have printed bulletin, uh, our prayer request for the week, and so we do, of course, have many different phrases and concerns there. Uh, we'll continue to lift our sympathies both to the Christensen family and the Gunther family. Uh, during the loss of their loved ones, and so uh, we continue to lift you up. I know we mentioned that last week, but we want to lift you guys up still. Uh, we also do want to let you know we can have a time of prayer. Uh, the altar rails are always open, so if you want to come and pray, you're welcome to do that. We also have a prayer room in the back, and just to let you know, one of our commitments says you never come to the altar alone. And so as you come forward uh, and you kneel, or if you need to stand, you can stand, or there's seats here if you need to sit in the front row. There'll be people that come lay their hands on you, uh, just as a sign of being with you, and also uh, to pray for you as well. So just know that uh, when your hand laid upon you, don't freak out. They're there to support you. It's okay. So let's now enter a time of prayer. Lord, as we enter into this time, we take just a moment to be silent. 
silent before you. Turn our attention to you and listen to your voice. God, as we gather together, we lift up your name. And we lift up the name of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, Lord, who is always with us, who once again proved your love toward us. That, Lord, even though it's been a week, we have gone through this week's trials, and you have been faithful. And we have gone through this world in the way it would distract us, and yet you have kept our attention and brought us closer home. So as we come here today, Lord, we lift up your name. We praise you for being a good God. We praise you loving us beyond all measure. God, as we are here today, we just thank you so much for life's blessings. Blessings of family, the blessings of church, the blessings of a great community, Lord, that has a lot of fun. We thank you, Lord, for the travels of visitors that are here today with us. And Lord, how great it is to worship among brothers and sisters and to once again be in your house. Lord, for all these blessings, we give you thanks and lift up your name. But Lord, we know that as we come here today, many of us come hurting. Many of us come with broken lives. And many of us come with pieces that we don't even know how to put back together. And so, Lord, it's through that that we bring our request to you. And we bring them to this altar and we ask, Lord, that once again, you would prove yourself faithful. And that, God, that these burdens that we lift up to you, that you would take them and put them upon your broad shoulders that can hold anything. And then wrap us in your arms. Remind us once again that you have us. And that you know the hairs on our head. And that, Lord, if you provide for the sparrow, how much more do you provide for us? And so, Lord, as we're here today, we come to you in that need. And we lift our arms wide open to embrace you once again. Admitting our own faults and how we mess up. Confessing our own sin before you. But Lord, once again, not relishing in those ideas, but relishing in the idea that you forgive us, and that, God, you accept us, and that, God, you bring us to be a new person. So, Lord, transform us once again. May, Lord, all those that are here today that are hurting, may they feel your touch. For those that need healing of the body, may you bring it. For those that need healing of the mind, may you bring that. For those that have broken relationships, may you bring, once again, your reconciliation of the cross to that relationship. May, Lord, those that are searching for jobs and work of their hands, may you provide for them. May those that are going through times of trial and those that are going through times of just um, of temptation, may you keep them strong and guide them along life's journey. Lord, we do lift up our first responders in the community as well as around the world, those in military service. May all of them instruments of peace and bring them home safely to their families. And God, finally, as we're here today, not only do we pray for those that are lost from you and that need to know of your love, we pray for our own souls to be once again aligned with your will. And we especially lift up our brothers and sisters in the Methodist denomination that me and St. Louis are here today, even in this moment, that are deciding different things about the future of this denomination. May Lord, you reign there. May you bring peace. May you bring good conversation. May Lord, you lead us in the path ahead. So whatever is decided, Lord, we pray that it would be your will. So God, we pray all these things. Once again, we cling to your cross and your resurrection. We know, Lord, that you give us new life once again. We continue to pray that prayer you taught your disciples all those years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses,
scripture reading this morning is taken from the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. <coughs> Ruth 3, 7 through 13. And read thus. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the green pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread a corner of your garment over me, since you are the guiding redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my time know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am the guiding redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guiding redeemer, good, let him redeem you. If he is not willing, as surely as the law lays, I will do it. Lie here to the morning. The words of the Lord. Amen. Good morning once again. Good morning. And to those joining us online, good morning to you as well as those that will watch this later. We want to welcome you uh, to our service here today as we uh, enter into the sermon time as we worship. We uh, want to pray here today. Uh, as many of you know, we've prayed many times um, and we continue to pray. We wanted to give you just a quick update. Uh, as you know, this is the weekend of the United Methodist Get Together in St. Louis. Uh, it started yesterday. I just want to give you a quick report of what's happened so far. And what has happened so far, I'm proud to actually tell you, is we pray. We actually spent really the whole day in prayer. We got online yesterday. They prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed. We prayed for everybody and their uncle and their sister and their daughter and their anybody. We prayed for everybody, right? And uh, we had a day of prayer, and it was really, really great uh, in so many ways to see the church do that. Um, but one thing maybe that didn't come out of it is we had some orientation about the delegates, about here's how the process works, and here's how to make a movement, and all those type of things. Uh, one thing that they did come out of it, the parliamentarian that they hired to come in and make sure it's all uh, done above board, uh, pretty much told us, he said, I read your transcripts. You guys don't know how to table something. So <laughs> that was pretty much the big takeaway from yesterday was everybody outside you know, the church came to us and said, uh, yeah, you need to learn how to actually table stuff. So uh, that was the big takeaway yesterday. Today they actually will meet and start actually doing more plenary sessions. So there will be much more to tell you about as time goes on. We are planning on next Sunday afternoon at 3.30, uh, just here in the church. Come on out for that if you want. Uh, just be a quick denominational update, and I say quick. Because all it is is just going to be informative of, hey, here's what did or did not pass, and here are how the group's responding to it so far. Uh, and that's all it's going to be. But if you're interested in that, please come out again next Sunday afternoon at 9.30. Uh, for those that, there's Chris, clean up, uh, Chris Cake's cleanup still going on. Just take a break, come on out for a couple minutes, and then you know, head on back, and uh, we'll clean up together. For those uh, that are joining with us again online, we want to welcome you. For those that are here visiting with us, we have, uh, in our middle, we are in the middle of sermon series, that is to say, and the sermon series is entitled... Love to love. Now, if you don't know where that comes from, it comes from the greatest romance movie of all time. The movie that taught me everything I needed to know about life. It was called <laughs> The Princess Bride, right? And there's a scene in there, I won't go to rehearsal again, but there's a sign that there's, there's a love to love part in that movie. And we've been taking this uh, season to just look at the different love stories of the Bible. And so we're on love story number three here today. And it's a story about Ruth and Boaz. Now, before we get there, I wanted to just kind of remind you of the greatness of the movie, <coughs> The Princess Bride. You see, it starts off with a farm, and a farm girl, if you will, and a farm boy, right? 
And Farm Girl is, you know, rides her horse and comes in and says, Hey, Farm Boy, shine my saddle. I want to see my face in it by morning. And the Farm Boy goes, As you wish. Right? <laughs> farm Boy, fill these with water. As you wish. And then one day it came where she realized that every time he said, As you wish, what he was really saying was, I love you. And so one day she's making the bread and she says, Farm Boy, looks around, tries to find something. Fetch me that pitcher. And he comes up and grabs it, looks at the eyes, as you wish. Right? And this story of love takes place. This is how the story really kind of starts. And it goes on, and he gets uh, captured and, and is supposedly killed by the Dread Pirate Roberts. And later on in the movie, as I told you last time, she gets kidnapped, and she's about to be married to this prince and all this stuff. She gets kidnapped. A whole bunch of stuff happens, but a man in black has been chasing her. A man in black finally has captured, you know, befriended off all the different kidnappers. He's captured her, and they're running for their, well, he's taking her, running for their lives, if you will, on the chase of the prince and his gallant steeds, and they're coming after them and chasing them down. And all of a sudden, they finally, they're running, and they're running, and they have to stop to catch their breath. And he throws her to a rock kind of thing, and she's sitting there, and she says these words, I know who you are. Your cruelty reveals everything. You're the dread pirate Roberts, admit it. With pride, what can I do for you? You can die slowly, cut into a thousand pieces. Highly, hardly complimentary, your highness. Why so venomous upon me? You killed my love. It's possible. I kill a lot of people. <laughs> Who was this love of yours? Another prince like this one? Ugly, rich, scabby? No, a farm boy. Poor, poor and perfect, with eyes like the sea before the storm. With his hands to his face, and you notice behind the mask he has a blood. <gasps> Could it be? On the high seas, your ship attacks, and the dread pirate Roberts never takes prisoners. You can't afford made exceptions. Once the word gets out, the pirates gone soft. It's nothing but work, 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 work. Right? You mock my pain. Life is pain, your highness. Anyone who says differently is selling something. I remember this farm boy of yours. I think it was five years ago. Does it pain you to hear it? Nothing you can say can upset me. He died well. That you should be should please you. No bribe attempts or blubbering. He simply said, please, please. I need to live. It was the please that caught my memory. I asked him what was so important. <coughs> True love, he replied. Then he spoke of a girl surpassing beauty and faithless. I can only assume he meant you. You should bless me before destroying him, before you find out what you truly were. And what am I? Faithfulness, madam, you are doing faithfulness. No, now tell me, truly, when you found out he was gone, did you engage to your prince that same hour, or did you wait a whole week in respect for the dead? You mocked me once, never do it again! And then all of a sudden the horses ride up in the background, the man in black turns, and she says, I died that day, and you can die too for all I care! And then one of the best parts of the whole movie, she shoves him, and he goes rolling down this huge hill, like really super steep, like rolling, and at first he goes, oh, on the first bounce, in the second bounce, he goes, and you can say it with me if you've seen the movie, As you wish. <laughs> which case she goes, Oh, my Wesley, my sweet Wesley, what have I done? And then she throws herself down the hill, and then they roll down the hill together. <laughs> but there was that moment in the moment of the story, right, where all of a sudden it became clear, like it also became crystal clear, like, Oh my gosh, I understand. This Dread Pirate Roberts guy is actually my sweet Wesley, and we're really supposed to be together. This is my love chasing after me and redeeming me. If you haven't ever seen the movie, I just heard some of it for you. I'm sorry, but it's still good. Right? And, and it has been like, what, 30 something years, 40 something years since it came out or whatever, so uh, you've had your time, so you should have watched it by now. But yeah, I'm sorry. But this story, right, it has this moment where it becomes all of a sudden crystal clear, and the whole storyline pivots, and all of a sudden it's a story about these two lovers trying to stay together in the midst of this prince chasing them, and, and all this type of stuff that happens. Well, our story today, our love story, has one of these moments that we just read. It's a story of Ruth and Boaz, but it's also a story of Naomi. And it's a story, just to give you a little bit of the background, this is the time of Judges. And if you ever go back and read the book of Judges, there's better times to live in history than the book of Judges, just so you know. It's kind of a crazy time, things are going on, all sorts of bad stuff. But there's a famine in the way. And this story really comes from the chapters of Ruth. Uh, it's only four chapters long, so if you want to read a book of the Bible tonight, go home and read four chapters, you've read a whole book. And it's such a good one. But the story of Ruth takes place, and there's this man named Elimelech married to Naomi, and he has two sons, and there's a famine in the land, so they move, and they leave, and they have to leave uh, the Bethlehem area, and they go all the way to Moab, and in Moab, the sons get married to some Moabite women. And they stay there for ten years. Well, Elimelech dies, 
The two sons died, so it's Naomi and the two daughters. And so, and the way this works is they're in a foreign land. The daughters have sort of, you know, gone into their family and left their family, so they don't actually have all sorts of stuff going on. So now they're pretty much destitute, so they said, hey, we've heard the famines ended in Bethlehem, so Naomi says, I'm going to go back to my people. And the daughters at first come with her, and then eventually she stops, she says, lady, you know, look, my, my daughters, you've been faithful, you've done your due diligence, go home, there's nothing for you where I'm going. Even if I was to get married, what if, if I had a kid tonight, you wouldn't get away until he grows up and then take care of you? I don't think so. So she tries to send them away, and one of them sent, goes away, her name's Orpah, and the second one is Ruth. And she clings to Naomi and basically begs her and says, no, 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 where you go, I'll go. Your gods will be my gods. Your people will be my people. And clings to her for her love for Naomi. And so fast forward the story, they come back to <coughs> Bethlehem area, and luckily for them, it's the time of the gleaning of the fields. And so it's the time where they're going out and they're threshing barley. And it's not quite wheat yet, but they're doing the barley. And so there was an uh, Old Testament law that said when you go out in your fields and you gather, you know, what they do is they chop it down, and then someone come behind and bundle the sheaves, and they take those sheaves to a mill and they grind it. But well, there was a law to protect poor people and the foreigners. And it was, while you're bundling, if stuff falls out, or as you're chopping, things don't fall right in order to get left behind, you don't go back a second time. You leave it. And you leave it purposely for the poor people of the area, or the refugee people, or the people that are sojourners, or the people that are just destitute, to be able to come forward, to have something to eat, to gather up themselves, to be able to take it freely, and to, to actually work for uh, their, their food. And so Naomi and Ruth have been uh, marginalized to this point where they used to be, you know, they owned the land back in the day, right? They had their own farms and stuff. And now they're at the point where they have to go gleaning. And Naomi's too old, so. Ruth goes out and says, she goes out and finds a field, <coughs> and she and starts gleaning. She gleans from the morning until about the afternoon time, and all of a sudden, the master of the land shows up, and his name is Boaz. Ladies, yeah. <laughs> Boaz. So I always thought, like, we need to take this name back. It needs to be, like, a cool name. We need to, like, cool Boaz people, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, so if you're going to name, if you're going to have a kid anytime soon, name it Boaz for me, just so that we can bring it back and it can be cool again. But anyways, Boaz, Boaz is like, one of the coolest people in the Bible, actually. I really love him. And uh, he comes up and, you know, he comes to see his people, check on him, how's it going. He's talking to his workers. He's like, who's, who's that woman over there? And they go, oh, that's uh, Ruth, the Moabitess, you know, Naomi's uh, daughter-in-law. And they tell her, and she basically they say, hey, she's been working really hard all morning long. She had one quick short break. She's working. And he tells her, he tells those workers, he says, all right, don't harm her. Let her pick from the bleedings. In fact, don't just let her pick from it. Even if she comes up to the parts that are bundled and she pulls a little bit out because they need a little more, don't even mock her for that. And then he goes on, he says, actually, you know what? Even beyond that, pull some of the leash sheaves out and leave it for her, right? And take care of her because he knew Naomi and he wanted to take care of them in the best way that he knew how. And so to do his part, and he saw people in need, and so he and himself took upon it to say, hey, I'm going to take some what I need. I'm going to make sure my people take care of Ruth and Naomi. And so at lunchtime, he invites her over. He gives her a full, as much as she can eat, and even gives her more to take home to Naomi. When the day is done, he actually gives her even a little bit more to take home to bring back to Naomi. Naomi comes, or Ruth, that is, comes back to Naomi, and Naomi uh, asks her, well, whose field did you go to? You got all this good stuff with your food. And Ruth tells her, hey, it's Boaz's. And Ruth goes, praise the Lord. And she did a little right to let me dance, right? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was a tap dance. I don't know. What do you want? And uh, she does a little dance, and she, she starts praising the Lord, and she says, Boaz, Boaz is one of our close relatives. He's one of our kinsmen, redeemers. Now, we don't have time to go into that term, but it is a huge, awesome term in the Old Testament. And it basically means a couple different things, but it basically means there was someone designated in your family that if stuff went wrong for you, their job was to redeem you back. So if you got sold into slavery, guess whose job it was? So there was someone designated to make sure those type of things didn't happen to you. And to go free you if you ever got captured. And to redeem you if you ever were found destitute. And to buy back your land if you were ever in trouble. All these type of things. Anyways, this kind of be a huge idea. I can't really explain it all in one deal. But he is a kid to redeem And so she says to Ruth, keep gleaning in his field. And so she keeps going back. And it seems like time goes on. It talks about the barley uh, harvest. And actually, there's a wheat harvest after that. It says that it goes through there. And then all of a sudden, one day, Naomi says to Ruth, Hey, here's what I want you to do. 
So the story gets hatched right here, where there is the party going on after the, the grain. It was a big celebration. You have the wheat festivals and things like that, the barley harvest. So they're harvesting it all. They bring it into the grinding mill, if you will, and they, they would have these sleds with oxen and stuff, and they would chop up all the different sheaves and everything and separate them. They would sift it. They would make all the grain and all that stuff that they would keep. Except you didn't want to do a lot of hard work and have someone steal it. So what would happen was is you'd have the party, but then if you were the owners and stuff and all your men, you would go to sleep next to all the stuff that you just had, right? You don't want people running off with it. You don't want the hard work to get it. So he's sleeping there, and she, Ruth that is, comes in, sneaks in, where she's not supposed to be. Ooh, going in the boy's bathroom, right? And she sneaks in and covers his feet, which is kind of weird to us, but okay. And he just covers his feet and lays down, like my dog does that. But she lays down at his feet, and what's the deal? In the middle of the night, his feet are very cold. Someone's going to wake him up. He's going to want to cover up, and as he covers up, he's going to notice her. Except, it's kind of a jerk thing to cover yourself up, but not the lady sitting at your feet, right? So there's kind of this, this big, big test, if you will, of Boaz that Ruth sets out. And Boaz, of course, asks, you know, who are you in the dark and all that stuff? And Ruth says, I'm Ruth, you know? And he goes, and she says, spread your garment over me, which... In those days, spreading your garment was the act of being married. And so, we had a proposal last night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was a proposal, right, on the threshing floor, if you will. And so, Boaz, instead of saying, you know what, you're a foreigner, you. Or instead of saying, uh, yeah, I don't really want to do that. Or instead of saying, all these different things that he could have, or embarrassed her in front of everybody, or done these different things, instead says, you faithful woman, you be blessed. This is a kindness. And he extends the cloak over her and he says, there's actually someone that is greater or closer to I that has the kinsman right redeemer over you. So I have to go up and get his permission first. But if he won't redeem you, I will make sure it happens. And so Ruth goes back, tells Naomi all that's happened. And Naomi's so excited. She says, don't worry. He's going to take care of this today. And sure enough, he brings the elders <coughs> together. And he, he asks them, he says, hey, you know, there's this field. And this is another Old Testament law that every seven years, if you had sold a field, it came back to you and your family. If you ever sold yourself as a slave, you were set free. It was a year of jubilee. And so was there was this idea that the land always stays with the descendants of Israel. And so there's this kind of thing that happens right here where the land is up for sale. And so the person, one of the kids, the redeemer, says, yeah, I'll buy it. Yeah, that sounds great. I'll buy you know, the land of Naomi and and then Boaz says, but there's one catch. Uh, you actually have to keep it in their lineage because they're still yeah. named Ruth for Naomi. And she's still a child bearing age, so you can still actually do your due diligence, if you will, help them bear a child, and it actually stays with their son <coughs> and family. And it just kind of when you ever get kind of these land kind of acronyms type of things, things can get really weird. So this is not a slight to the person. So he says, I can't do that. Because it might jeopardize the rest of my my belong, my, my inheritance and my stuff. And there's kind of these weird rules and all this stuff, but it could happen like that, where like he could legitimately, by trying to do the right thing, actually cheat his other children out of their inheritance, if you will. And so it kind of gets this weird type of thing, but basically what ends up Boaz, he says, you know what, Boaz, you do it. And so Boaz gets the sandal, takes it off, right, and gives it as a testimony that he's bought the land. All the elders go, yes, we agree. And then they start blessing him. I want to just read you the blessing real quick, it's really neat. It's kind of this fun little thing that happens at the end here. So the elders come, and they bless Boaz, and they say these words. They say, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming to your home like Rachel and Leah. Now, we talked about them last week. Lots of kids, lots of people, lots of descendants. Like the whole house of Israel that's been built up. May you have a standing in Ephrathah, and be famous in Bethlehem. Someone from Bethlehem becomes famous later. Through their offspring, the Lord gives you by this woman. May your family be like Perez and Tamar of Judah. And so they bless Boaz and Ruth and Naomi in this. And then the kind of story ends right there. But then it doesn't, because it gives a little epilogue. And the epilogue is one of these things that you go, oh. That's kind of cool. And the epilogue goes like this there's a genealogy of Naomi through Ruth and Boaz. And it goes like this. It goes a little bit further back, actually. It says, 
This is the family line of Perez. Perez is the father of Hezron. Hezron is the father of Ram. Ram is the father of Amminadab. Amminadab is the father of Nashon. Nashon is the father of Simon. Simon is the father of Boaz, the father of Obed, the father of Jesse, the father of David. And what's so cool about this story is, first of all, I love a story that doesn't have bad guys, and the story has no bad guys in it whatsoever. In fact, everybody in it does the best thing they can the whole entire time. And they're all little, tiny things. And the thing about the book of Judges, when God's dealing with wars and people going on, and he's trying to get the Israelites to do the right thing and all these type of things, there's this little story of people doing small things, but trying to do the right things for other people. And it's through all those little tiny small things, doing it right for other people, that God brings in the lineage of David and thus the lineage of Jesus Christ. And he does it through a Moabite woman, not an Israelite. And he does it through a woman who loves her mother so much, she won't let her be destitute. And he does it through a man that is so kind that he won't let a foreign woman noble character go to waste. Instead, he redeems them and brings them to this great story. Now, as you're here today, you may sit there and you may say, you know, <laughs> when you think about how the world changes, when you think about how things happen in this world, you always think of the big names, don't you, right? People that win the Nobel Peace Prize, right? People that do amazing, big, huge stuff. But I think one of the catches of this story, one of the things that reminds us is it's not always the case that's the way God works. Sometimes God does do the feeding of the 5,000. Sometimes God does raise people from the dead, right? He does all these amazing things, but sometimes God uses you and me in the simplest little things that we do to bless other people with the ordinary needs that we have. He takes those kind, compassionate hearts and he uses them to bring about David's and eventually Jesus Christ. So as you're here today, never say to yourself, it's too small, this kind of deed that I'm doing. Never say to yourself, this little small thing that I'm doing to change the world, this is insignificant. And never say to yourself, this one little act of kindness means nothing in the grand scheme. Because God has a way of weaving all these things together and making something beautiful. Let us pray. Lord, as we're here today, we thank you so much for your story, of this great story of Ruth and of Boaz, and Naomi. And these great people, Lord, that want to do everything in their power right, that work hard when they needed to, that loved people when they needed to, that reached down and saw people in need and wanted to help them. And God, even though they weren't blessed with phenomenal cosmic powers, they were blessed with what they had. And what they used, they used what they had, that is to say, even the small things that you brought about, ultimately, Jesus Christ through their lineage. So Lord, as we're here today, when we give you Thanks and honor once again, because so many times we are told the lie that what we do doesn't matter, and that what we do, even on the small things, and the acts of kindness, and reaching out to those that are hurting, and reaching out to those that are poor, that, Lord, it does nothing. It doesn't fix the problem. But, God, we know a bigger truth, that you leave your work and your kingdom through these small acts. So, Lord, help us to always see the bigger picture. And help us to see the tapestry you weave when all your people come. And the story has no bad guys, but you bring about your great work. We pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
us, who sees us in need and covers us with his garment. And in that moment tells us, as we <laughs> may that God bless you and keep you and make you to be a gracious person unto others. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Amen.